Space is really exciting right now. SpaceX last year launched almost 100 missions to low Earth orbit. So that's a rocket flying from Florida to space every three or four days, all year. Woody, on behalf of the Berkeley Space Center and Citrus, the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society and the Balatow Institute, it's an honor for us to have you on the UC Berkeley campus today. It's been a few years um, since uh, you finished your PhD, actually here on the seventh floor of this very building, the Sutata Dai Hall at Citrus headquarters, uh, where we are sitting here today. Um, I remember very fondly the times when you and I were discussing convex optimization formulations of aerospace system optimization with posinomials and many other things in this very building. And it's been quite a path for you um, from UC Berkeley student to MIT professor and to a NASA astronaut. This is the first time we're hosting you since uh, you've been back from the International Space Station. And I can tell you the level of enthusiasm here at Berkeley is just through the roof. So the first question I have for you today relates to your time at UC Berkeley. You did complete a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science. Can you tell us about elements of your PhD, your training, and all the things you learned at Berkeley that you retained during your career as an astronaut? Well, thanks, Alex. And first of all, it's so good to be back at UC Berkeley, back in Sutarja Dai Hall. I obviously spent many, many hours and days uh, studying in this building, and uh, it's just wonderful to be back here at UC Berkeley. In terms of uh, applying my PhD research, I guess two parts. Number one, the convex optimization formulations for engineering design. I still find it relevant. I find that I think in terms of trade-offs and Pareto frontiers and it's just sort of infected me and in how I see the world. And that's certainly relevant as we think forward to our designs for the Artemis missions to the moon and going on to Mars. But then also I think the PhD experience, as I'm sure is true for many people, really taught me how to think. And it taught me how to truly, truly, deeply understand something. And I use that, those skills too. Maybe a more indirect way that I use my PhD, but when I approach new problems out in the world now, um, I feel like the training that I received here certainly uh, helps me view and formulate problems in the world. Wow, this is what um, every PhD advisor would like to hear, not just the content, but also the methodology. And um, specific to skills, are there any specific skills, technical skills that you still find useful in your job? Your job is very different from what you were doing here when you were a student. Nevertheless, there might still be things that are still helpful. Yeah, I mean, how to think about problems, how to code. I, I still code uh, a fair amount. Now, I knew that before I was a PhD student, but I certainly perfected those skills while I was here. Um, I also spent time while I was here at UC Berkeley doing, of all things, uh, search and rescue in Yosemite National Park. And my PhD advisor, Peter Abiel, I can't thank him enough for being open and willing to kind of take a risk on letting me disappear for the summer, uh, work search and rescue as a seemingly unrelated uh, set of skills to what I was doing in my PhD research. But while I was working search and rescue out in Yosemite, I was often sitting in the SAR cache, writing code on my laptop, um, doing my PhD research, waiting for calls to come in. And that was a very formative period of my life. And uh, it was something a bit outside of my academic research, but uh, those kind of operational skills that I gained doing that, uh, I, f I still find very useful today uh, in my astronaut role. This is wonderful. I was going to ask you about that experience later as well, <laughs> um, mostly in terms of the life of a PhD student. So we will come back to that. Great. Um, and maybe to close on that first session of the conversation, um, in what ways having a PhD from an electrical engineering and computer science makes you different from other astronauts uh, in the way you think about space or accomplishing your mission? I think what's striking with astronauts these days is the diversity of profiles we see in space. Um, so, yeah, tell us about your vision. Yeah, 100%. That is spot on. I think uh, it really is about the diversity of backgrounds. And I think we're selecting classes now uh, in the era of ISS and Artemis missions that have a very diverse set of backgrounds. So I came in as an engineer, you know, a, uh, I was an MIT faculty member when I uh, got selected, but, but a, an engineer at heart. Um, we have pilots, test pilots, we have physicians, we have, uh, we have a Mars geologist in my class. We have Navy SEAL, submariners, um, 
just this huge diversity of backgrounds. And I think that is what really gives us strength as an astronaut core. Ultimately, when we go to the ISS or we go do a mission to the moon, we actually kind of all become uh, capable of doing the same things, but we all come at that with these different backgrounds. And in that way, just the way we approach problems, the way we think about things is ever so slightly subtly different. And therefore, as a team, when we're a crew, let's say up on the space station, we're a stronger team because we think about things a little bit differently. Wow, it's such an inspiring experience. So as you know, Woody, Berkeley has engaged in this exciting project where we're building a new campus um, at NASA Ames uh, on a parcel, a 36 acres parcel. We're going to build 1.4 million square feet of building over the next couple of years, uh, which hopefully one day will become the home of maybe a new aerospace or aeronautics and astronautics department. The goal is that we can co-locate in that facility a variety of stakeholders, private partners, academia, and NASA. As we're envisioning this new campus we're building, uh, the question I have for you is, you've seen space from space, and from your experience, uh, what would be the dream way of constructing such a campus? Um, how do we get the private sector to work hand-in-hand -hand with academia and with government agencies? Um, is there any way that you would recommend that we could build that campus? Well, I'm so excited to hear about the Berkeley Space Center. I sure wish such a uh, facility and project had been around uh, when I was here. Um, it's really, really exciting uh, that this is happening. And honestly, I can't think of a better time to be embarking on this endeavor. Um, space is really exciting right now. SpaceX last year launched almost 100 missions to low Earth orbit. So that's a rocket flying from Florida to space every three or four days all year. And they'll probably go above 100 this coming year. So we have new and improved, relatively affordable access to low Earth orbit. We're continuing our NASA presence on the International Space Station, doing a combination of basic research and also technology demonstration. And I just think this combination of industry, startups, academia, and government bringing NASA in is the ideal setup for bringing new innovations along, uh, new ideas into the marketplace, but then also leveraging our experience in space. We've been 23, 24 years now of continuous human presence on the ISS. And so, you know, being able to actually maybe fly things to the space station, do research aboard the space station, give these opportunities to students to do hands-on work, it's all just really exciting. And I think it'll be great for the students, great for the companies that have chosen to partner with Berkeley, great for Berkeley, and great for NASA. Wow. Um, it's so nice to see your vision fully aligned with what we've been uh, conceived and is so also inspirational to hear it in your own terms as an astronaut. Now, continuing with your experience in space, um, sustained presence in space is difficult. Um, and we understand uh, the moon is probably training ground for maybe one day going to Mars. Yeah. Um, from your perspective and from your experience, what are the skills and what are the advances we need to enable a more sustained life in space through so maybe tomorrow the moon and maybe the day after tomorrow Mars? Space is hard. Uh, stuff breaks in space in ways that you never would have expected. And what's inspiring for me is seeing us commit to actually embarking on these challenges. Uh, not just understanding what they are or studying them, but actually going and doing them. And we've been doing that aboard the space station now for almost 24 years. So I like to say that the last time all living humans were on Earth was fall of 2020. And since then, we've had a continuous human presence aboard the space station. And we've just learned so much. We've done so much research, so much science. We've also learned a lot about how to live and work in space. And we've really perfected the uh, parts of space operations that we need to now go beyond low Earth orbit. Um, and I think we're going to see an analogy of that play out on the moon. With Artemis, we're going to go set up a proving ground to get to Mars. And it's the ideal place to, to do a combination of studying basic science, you know, studying the origins of our solar systems and origins of the universe, using the moon to do that. We're going to the South Pole, which is different than Apollo. Apollo went to the equatorial regions. We're going to go to the South Pole. There's water ice there. And so we can do science there, but then we can also use that water ice, for example, to do in-situ resource utilization and perfect those techniques that we are ultimately going to need to uh, trust our lives to in order to go to Mars. And so we can do it in a place that's, uh, that we can still come home from safely if things don't go to plan, 
And not everything will go to plan, but we can go get the reps, get that kind of operational cadence going, break things, and uh, just get all the systems uh, working and firing all, on all cylinders before we go to Mars. This is so exciting. Um, going back to your experience when you were at Citrus, part of the mission of Citrus when you were a student here was to accelerate the pipeline from inception in the lab to deployment for society. While you've been in space, you've done a lot of science, you've done a lot of experiments. That's part of the jobs there. Um, in some ways, there's a bit of an analogy of PhD students doing work here. And the question I have for you is, uh, can you tell us about a few of the um, scientific work you did up there? Yeah, so I was actually, I, I'm told that I participated in actually hundreds of scientific research studies. Some of them, I was the test subject myself. Others, I maybe was in a glove box operating the experiment. But a whole range of interesting scientific work and it was really rewarding just seeing the uh, teams of principal investigators on the ground see their uh, results come to life. Um, one that I found really interesting was a facility called the Biofabrication Facility, where we actually printed the first ever section of human meniscus to be printed in space. Um, and so this is a technology demonstration where we're showing that we can use the unique uh, weightless environment on the space station to manufacture structures that you couldn't manufacture on Earth. They would essentially become a puddle. Um, you have sedimentation, materials of different densities. Um, these things would just collapse under their own weight. But in space, you can create structures that can't support their own weight. And so this is a, a new um, potential application of uh, ac cheap access to low Earth orbit. And we printed a meniscus. That facility is going to go on eventually to print blood vessels. And I think it's just the very beginnings of, you know, in-space manufacturing. But that was really fun getting to be a part of that right in the early stages. Wow, this is so inspirational for the students. I, I feel those students really, um, many of them will aspire to, to do the kind of work that you did up there in space. And maybe a first step towards this is this new Berkeley Space Center we're building at NASA Ames. Hopefully one day will be the home of a new aeronautics and astronautics department. And so at NASA Ames, we have access to this amazing collection of facilities, wind tunnels, uh, flight simulators, Mars rovers, and many uh, such installations that can support how to learn to operate in space. And uh, from your perspective, as a first step for students like UC Berkeley students who will be studying there, what are the specific infrastructure or test facilities we should really consider in building the future workforce of the space and training them on them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's fantastic that um, Berkeley is leveraging existing infrastructure at Ames and partnering with NASA in this way. And I would just encourage students to get their hands dirty. I mean, and work on on real things. You know, get an experiment uh, aboard the space station. That's actually possible. You know, I I operated a student built uh, experiments in space, uh, so it's actually possible to get an experiment flown aboard the space station. For a student to have that experience, wow, what an what a incredible thing to do as part of your undergrad, maybe, or part of your, your graduate studies. And then just, just getting your hands dirty with real hardware. I'm so passionate about that. It's been a big part of my um, kind of development throughout my career, and uh, particularly hardware that could be going to space. Or, or maybe it's aeronautics. I mean, uh, eVTOL, uh, air, electric air taxis, you know, just getting your hands dirty with the real hardware. Um, I think it's so important. And some of the real interesting challenges are right there at the intersection of different fields. That's why I love aerospace. It brings together so many different uh, fields of study to go kind of do the impossible. And uh, I just love it. And it's such an amazing opportunity for students. This culture is so aligned with what the Citrus mission was. In fact, when you were a student on the seventh floor, the PR2 robot was there. And yeah. getting your hands dirty is really the thing. It's like the robot is one thing. An algorithm is another thing. And so um, this vision of getting your hands dirty is really, I think, what we're aspiring there. And we really look forward to this partnership with NASA Ames. In all your memories, uh, do you have the most fun experience or memory at Berkeley? Well, it's got to be the people. I just remember all the time spent with my fellow grad students and uh, maybe with my PhD advisor, Peter Abiel. Um, I fondly remember just sitting in front of a whiteboard doing math with Peter. That was uh, really rewarding. I learned a ton. And it was just always fun to discuss uh, challenging math problems. And my last question to you is, if there was one message you would want to give to UC Berkeley students, what would it be? Well, it would have to be, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it's follow your passions. And really what that means for me is it's great to work on 
things that are difficult. It's great to challenge yourself, but I think it's also really important to work on things that are rewarding as you're doing them, um, to not necessarily uh, pick your path based on where you think it will lead, but just pick your path based on what you're interested in and excited about in the moment. Um, I've been encouraging people to shorten their time horizon. And uh, I think through that process of working on things that are actually exciting in the moment, uh, it's just natural to do better work than would otherwise be possible and to end up going places you would never imagine. Woody, it's been such an inspiring conversation. I want to thank you for being here today. And on behalf of the Berkeley Space Center and Citrus, I would like to thank you for coming to our campus today. Thank, thank you so much. Alex. It's so great to be back.